Praise the Lord. We're going to read uh, Psalm 139. It says, O thou, oh, excuse me, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and hast and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the ut uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the night are, and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my, my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Verse 15 says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. So we'll read until verse 15 only in this case. So, in reading verse number one again, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. The Lord knows everyone, even his own people. His search of a person might be a test. But since the Lord is omniscient, that just means that he knows me even before he had given me any test of my character or how I may respond to a certain situation. So it's really uh, for us. Thus, the search in this case might be related to giving a test to a Christian. And that would conclude his desire to know my reaction. But even before he would start, he would also, he already know how I would react to it. Thus, the idea is the following. God had known about us before our life even began. He knew what our thoughts would be, the actions that we would take, all of our sins that we would commit, and everything that we would say or do during our entire life, and what our ultimate judgment would be based on our decisions and actions and thoughts. Yet it is God who gives mankind a choice to be with him forever or to be against him. But the best is always to be for God. For there is so much that one gets as reward in future. He deserves all the praise and all the glory and all the honor for what he has done. He has created us. He has given us life. Verse 2 says, Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. When a person moves about, sits down, or even lies down to rest or sleep, God already knows before the person begins his rest or sleep. The psalmist is here just giving more examples of what God knows to help the reader understand the knowledge of God. Thus, in other words, all of our activities will be known to God in the time of his judgment, for he already knows them 
In fact, the psalmist goes even deeper than that. He sheds light on the fact that God knows even our thoughts. How did the psalmist come to that conclusion? It must have been the inspiration of God for him to write it, but also the first time it is mentioned as God having known the thoughts of mankind was written by Moses in Genesis 6, 5. And it states in Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So there in that verse, which Moses had written, states that God knew the thoughts, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. He knew everyone's thoughts. He knew who was righteous, that is Noah. He knew all their others who were wicked and he knew their thoughts and then those thoughts translated or changed into actions which were of violence and corruption thus what the children of Lear Israel had learned from what Moses had written about the time even before the flood was that God had known about the thoughts of all mankind. Therefore, um, during a person's own life, and when God gives life to us, he knows our thoughts. He knows the first thought that we've ever had as a child. He knows even until the last thought that we think about in this life. He knows the thoughts of the righteous. He knows the thoughts of the wicked. He's not blind to either one. He knows all of them. And it was written that God had known those thoughts. And of course, those thoughts that uh, Genesis 6 uh, refers to are uh, wicked thoughts, but it brought, brought about wicked actions as well. Therefore, we have to think purely and think righteously because when we focus on the things that are righteous pure and good then that will translate into our actions being good as well however when genesis 6 refers to people that were on the earth that had thought evil and their imagination of their thoughts of their heart were wicked and uh, bad thoughts continually, then uh, there came into existence a corruption and a violence on earth. So Genesis 6, 11 states, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Therefore, we should make sure that we are thinking properly, thinking good thoughts, honorable thoughts, righteous thoughts. Thus the psalmist knew what, that God had known about the thoughts of mankind, and he wished to share this thought with the readers, so that any who would follow God will know that God already knows our thoughts. Therefore, one should only think good thoughts, because God is already understanding our thoughts. And so... Uh, a person who becomes a Christian, whoever reads the Bible, can figure out that God does know our thoughts. We can hide our thoughts from people. Sometimes people can figure out what we're thinking, but mm, we have thoughts that we think that nobody even finds out about. The only one that really finds out about it or knows about it is God. Later, people might find out about it because whoever does wrong, does wicked things, well, obviously, they were thinking wicked thoughts before they started to do their wicked action. So that's why it's so important to maintain our thoughts, first of all, righteous, because then it will trigger our action. Verse number three says, Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. 
Once more, there is instruction here that God knows not only our thoughts, but also all our ways. What are our ways? That is, in one aspect of it, is where we go. <laughs> our ways, where we go. Thus, God knows everywhere we go and how we get there. Further, he also knows about how we do something. Some may ask, how do you do this? Well, God already knew how we did it. And so he knows the manner in which we act. He knows how we did something. He, he knows where we go. So when he, when it speaks of knowing our ways, what is defined as our ways, it could be concealed up in any action or any thought, the manner in which we do something, all is open to his eyesight, or in other words, he knows all about it. Nothing can be hidden from his view. He sees it all. Verse number four says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. So it goes from the thoughts to the words to the action. And so there's not a word that God does not know about already that is in our tongue or that we are speaking it first it comes as a thought then it comes out in the mouth and some people think well they talk but in any case it's a thought process a speaking process an action process he knows all of that whether it be a thought whether it be a speak a speech or speaking or action. He knows all of it. So here the psalmist lets us know that all words that we speak to, he knows every single one of them, even before they are spoken. God knows that these words actually come from our thoughts, put into words, then acted out. God knows each individual word, each sentence, and every part of our speech. God knows it, and he knows every conversation that has ever gone, uh, that has ever been had, ever, every conversation that has ever had been, has gone on in this life from the time of Adam at the beginning with himself all the way to the last man that will be born or raised up or last child. And he knows what that conversation was about, what it was for, what was said, whether it was not it was for God or against God or some kind of good that came out of it or bad that came out of it. He knows it all. Verse 5 says, Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Here also the psalmist has discovered that God was behind and before, meaning that God knew our past, knows our future. He also protects us from our behind and to the front of us, keeping his hand upon our lives. That is one great thing about God. He's always protecting us. His love is always with us. His hand is upon us. It means that God's hand is ready, willing, and willing to do things for us when we call or request his help. His hand is always there. Verse 6 says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. He's talking about what he has just spoken about, what God knows, and that he is with us. His hand is upon us. So the psalmist even states that idea that knowing about God's ever-present knowledge of our lives is beyond him. What God knows is beyond our ability to think how much God knows and cares about us and what God does. It's really awesome. Too awesome for us to really uh, take into consideration on our finite minds. 
It's our beyond our ability to even contemplate or imagine. For God is grand. He's truly uh, bigger than the universe. And we could say his mind is bigger than the universe. He is bigger than his, I don't know. He is, he's just humongous. All his thoughts, all his plans, all his, his uh, ways are grand, great. Words cannot describe the greatness of our God. It's beyond man's thoughts or contemplation. Though we receive his, his thoughts through uh, the language that God has given to us, but it's uh, really, um, there is, we, I mean, if we were able to, in some way, express all of the things that God knows, it would be beyond human humanity because humanity is very limited. And so for humans to come to a complete knowledge about what God knows is really unthinkable in the, even in the aspect of eternity would have all eternity to try to figure out what God knows and we'd still we'd still not be able to even scratch the surface of everything that he knows but his thoughts are so much higher and better and his thoughts and his ways give us purpose, give us hope, give us life. Everything about him gives us um, uh, a better life. So his thoughts are beyond our thoughts. But when we do think about what God says or what God does, or what God thinks, our lives are better. It helps our mind, it helps our lives, it helps our spirit. And in essence, uh, some people say that what we dwell on, what we think about, our emotion kind of affects our body. And that is better for us to dwell on his thoughts, his ways. In Psalm 138 and verse number seven, it says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. So here, I mean, his thoughts, the God's thoughts unto me, they are even great. The sum of them, if you count all of the thoughts to that God has for me, as the psalmist says, they're great. I mean, it's, I mean, it's how great you can't even really imagine how great his thoughts and his plans are for us. The thoughts of God are also the words that God speaks in the written word that has been shared with us also to the psalmist and to us who believe in him even today to the church, the value of them are, uh, the value of them is truly great. Hallelujah. In Psalm chapter 94, verse number 11, it says, the, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. The thoughts of man are vanity, but when mankind thinks about the th thoughts of God, what God says in his word. That is where it's not vanity. It is actually good. But we have to have his thoughts in us. We have to think about what he desires. We have to concentrate on his word. And that's when our, va our thoughts become valuable. Psalm chapter 92 and verse number 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Thus, when the context of Psalm 139, the psalmist also wishes to acknowledge the fact that it mattered not where a person went from God, he would always be wherever a man traveled to. The psalmist was right on target to understanding and sharing what he had learned about God and his omnipresence and about his thoughts. 
Verse number 7 to verse number 10, it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. In this portion, the psalmist even goes further by stating that there was no place that a person could go without or get out of the reach of God. Everything is in his hands. Or the presence of God, it's there. That's a good thing because today, if we want to receive the Spirit of God, we want to talk to God in prayer. It matters not where they are. They don't have to go to a certain place to pray. They can pray wherever they are. Though it's good to get privacy. <laughs> and, but that it's just saying that we can feel the presence of God in any place today. And the reason why we can feel the presence of God is because Jesus Christ died for us. And he shed his spirit he paid the price so that mankind could actually feel the presence of god it doesn't matter if you're a believer or unbeliever when you get to that place where god pre god's presence comes in you can feel it but it's better to have the presence of god obviously in a person's life one can be at land or at sea in an airplane or in a mine digging the psalmist uh, states that there is the presence of God no matter where a person goes. So he would repeat the fact that God's hand would be there with him, as he stated in verse number 5. In verse 10, it refers to the hand of God leading the psalmist, which means that God's hand will also lead us. Yes, he will lead us. His power, his right hand, would hold us. Therefore, the power of God holds us in place. He has everything, as they say, in his hand. Our lives are in the hands of God. Verse number 11 and 12, it says, If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. The idea from the psalmist in this verse means that it mattered not whether it was day or night. God saw or sees everything. Even with the darkness all around, one cannot hide himself because God knows exactly where we are. We try to play hide and seek and there's no hiding for God from God. So God can't play that game because he knows everywhere where mankind is. No, I mean, uh, not Noah. Jonah, Jonah tried it. He tried to hide from God, but obviously even in a boat going away, further away from where he was supposed to be, it mattered not where Jonah went, God's hand was there <laughs> he was able to persuade him to come back and to do his will to preach to Nineveh even with all the darkness all around the psalmist or around us God can see right through the darkness and it's like the darkness and the, and the light is the same God sees everything Clearly, whether or not it's light or dark, it doesn't matter. Of course, man's eyes, we can see in the light, but when it's dark, it's like, I can't see very well. But God can see right through it. He knows everything that happens in the dark. He knows everything that happens in the light. But here it states that his hand is pr a protection is... Um, upon us and it is we could say just as strong in the daytime as in the night even though that people would think uh oh it's nighttime and it's very late but God's presence is everywhere and he sees everything 
Therefore, any light or darkness does not stop his hand from holding us in his place and where he wants us in having uh, his hand upon us. With the eyes of God, there's nothing he cannot see. For mankind, mankind's eyes can not see the best things during the nighttime or the bad things uh, at times. But God can and does see everything, no matter what they are and whether it is in the midst of such darkness or such great light. The great lights do not blind the eyes of God, nor does the pitch dark keep his eyes from seeing anything at all. Everything, even though it's tried, or the, even though man tries to hide it from God, it can't be hidden. It's not possible. It's impossible to hide anything from God. He knows everything. Verse number 13 says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The psalmist leads us to understand that God is the one who has our reins, the ones that are his, meaning that God can lead us and turn us into this direction or that or stop us from doing something that he didn't want, doesn't want us to do. This is not only for the psalmist, of course, but it's also for the ones that serve God today the Christians. God has a hold of our reins, meaning that he can turn us and try to stop us where he wants us to be at the right moment, at the right time. It's like when one person is riding on a horse and he's holding the reins, he can say, whoa, and then stop the horse at the proper time, at the proper area where he wanted to stop. Let's hope. But God can do that. He has our reins. In fact, here is a portion of Scripture that gives an indication that God's hand is even upon us when we are in our mother's womb. God keeps his hand over us even there. Which goes along with what the psalmist had stated previously, that no matter where one might be, God is always there. You can't hide um, a baby from the eyes of God. God sees it. God knows exactly what the baby is feeling. What he see, what the baby sees. Well, probably not. Doesn't see anything. But uh, he knows everything about the baby, even the thoughts that the baby might start thinking. Though I probably don't remember anything about that. God knows. And the things that we will learn about ourselves in heaven is going to be great, too. It even leads us to believe that we are human beings at the point of being in the womb. For the psalmist even declared himself being covered by God in his mother's womb. That in itself points to the fact that babies in the womb have God's protection, too, and are human beings that ought never to be murdered, and quite frankly, not murdered by their own mothers, who should be given them protection, love, and warmth. In verse number 14, it says, I will praise thee, for the I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Here it is, the psalmist explaining very well that in the previous verse, God had his hand of protection on him. It is in this verse that the psalmist was fearfully or explaining that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist gives credit to God for his work in the womb of the mother. As babies are made there in the womb, they are made by God there and given life there, and it was his place that he wanted a small uh, baby growing as its residence for a few months of its first, uh, in the first part of his life. 
And indeed, humans at conception, that is the idea here presented. Um, that life starts there. Even with Mary and Elizabeth, the meeting of those two, with two babies in their wombs, there was recorded what happened. And so Luke, the writer of more words in the New Testament than even Paul, which would astound many people, but that's what I understand from looking on the internet, that he wrote, he had written more words than the Apostle Paul. He was a gentle to, a Gentile too. He, he was the one who gave us that meeting. And he spoke about the babies in the womb. John the Baptist, as a baby, quote unquote, met Jesus in the womb. But, I mean, they were separate in separate bodies and there were walls of, of flesh between them, but still um, something happened there. They, the presence of God must have touched John. The psalmist and we too should know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And that process of growth is in the womb of the mother. Yet we have already been made in the womb of the mother. We are human beings. At that point, life has come. It was the psalmist's idea to praise God for that and for the fact of his right hand being upon him even there, and being his leader, his guide, and so on. We should praise God too, just like the psalmist or even more so than he or any of the Old Testament saints had done, for we have the Holy Spirit of God and have so much more knowledge of God and the presence of God with us too. In verse number 15, it says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts, lowest parts of the earth. The psalmist seems to indicate more thoroughly about when a human being is a human being. The making of a human being is done in secret. Nothing can be hidden from the eyes of God. Amen. For he sees exactly at the time that we are made, and he knows the exact timing too. Who could say that they know when a person was made? In the time that this was written, in the psalmist's time period, of course, no one knew exactly when people were formed in the womb. The lady would know later on that she was pregnant, but at the, that moment that she became pregnant, that was a mystery. Surely they would think, well, I don't know if I'm going to be pregnant or not after this. But later on, they would find out. So it was kind of like a mystery of whether or not she was pregnant. It was God who knew because God, from God comes life at that moment. No one else gives life to mankind but God himself. And Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and life. Therefore, it is Jesus who is God and who gives us life from the womb of our mother. For the church, too, we are born spiritually at birth, whether it be physical or spiritual. There are witnesses of it, either witnesses on earth or angels of, or God himself in the heavenlies. Yet a conception, though it may not have been known by man for a long time, and it may not be known by man that it is a life, uh, God knew already the time and the moment that he gave life. And it didn't matter where it was, on a mountaintop or down in the valley, uh, going on the seas or wherever. Uh, he knows everywhere, anyone who has, he has given life to.
For he has to give life in order to man, for mankind to have life. And he does so physically and spiritually too. But for that physical process it's talking about, no one knows, or at least God knew in that secret place when it happened. So he knew and he loves his creation. Uh, that is something that God loves to do is create. It has never been a secret to him, but it's always open and seen in every place where he gives life, especially spiritual life. He loves to give spiritual life, not just in certain places, but he loves to give spiritual life in every corner of the globe. May God bless you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.